Welcome. I'm Gwen Shapira. I'm Tim Berglund. And this is Ask Confluent, where we give real answers to pressing questions from Twitter, YouTube, and elsewhere. Two weeks back, we announced the Confluent operator for Kubernetes. And boy, did this generate yeah. a lot of questions. Yeah, it was kind of crazy, right? Yeah, and it, it kind of reminded me at the time when we announced exactly once. Yes. And the entire world went, what? They Is that even possible? They announced it was not possible. Same, <laughs> same thing. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. So here we are again, people looking at a confluent operator for Kubernetes and saying, is that even a thing? Yeah. So let's look at some questions from Twitter let and me, see uh, what they say. Let me see what we have here. So uh, John Hug, uh, your friend and mine. So he's responding to a tweet of Jay's. Jay said, a lot of people question whether you can run stateful systems like Kafka and Kubernetes. The answer is that you absolutely can, but there is really significant infrastructure needed to do this well, just as there is for running on bare metals. That's Jay Krebs' tweet. Uh, John says, next question, replace can with should. A lot of people question whether you can run stateful systems. John is asking- Whether you should. Should, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, so obviously it kind of depends on what we're doing and we're not really here to sell anyone on Kubernetes specifically, mm -hmm. but a lot of people are running a lot of stuff on Kubernetes. All their microservices, a lot of their stateless systems, a lot of stuff on Kubernetes already. And it makes a lot of sense since you have all this infrastructure, why not use the same infrastructure that you already set up to also run Kafka? And Confluent is not just about Kafka, right? We also have... Confluent uh, connectors and connect, uh, Kafka Connect workers and Kafka Streams and KSQL. So you re it's really about running a big ecosystem on a cluster management systems that is built to run big ecosystems. Right. Like you're already there. You've got the investment. You're doing Kubernetes. Go all in. There's a kind of a move for people to just go all in. And since they want to, we want to make it easy on them. Yeah, exactly. So it's up to them to decide if they should, but we want to help the people yeah. who decide that they should, we want to help them out. So you don't have to, right? Like you're, you could have data infrastructure that's outside of Kubernetes and all of your microservices in Kubernetes or whatever, but that's not what a lot of people want. They exactly. want to, so yes. yeah. Uh, should you, I don't know if we say should, but want to, uh, we want to make it easy. Yes. All right. What's next? Um, so as a follow-up oh, follow for question. John, John Hugg says that he doesn't really know that many people went stateful and are happy with it. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think even, I didn't find the exact tweet, but prominent Kubernetes advocates say that they're not very sure on whether stateful sets are still a good idea. And that's, well, Kelsey Hightower, he's he's Exactly. He's, uh, and you'd think that he knows that. what he's talking Probably about. He knows what he's talking about. Yeah, so the, <laughs> the, 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 the discussion's happening, you know. Yes, but then again, you talk to the other half of the world and they're running stateful sets quite happily. And it's right. a thing that exists. It's supported by not even just one company. And Kafka is not the only stateful set out there. It seems to work. It worked, you know, it works on my machine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's containers, so that means something now. All right, what's next here? What do we got? Uh, Stefan uh, uh, Dejocio. Let's go with that. Uh, Stefan asks, is it very useful to put Kafka clusters on Kubernetes? Kind of the same question. Is this not just some overhead to get technical perfection, in quotes, that is everything in the same place, in parentheses? <laughs> Kafka is inherently stateful, Stefan says. Um, and needs good resources and monitoring, et cetera, why bother? That's a very good question. Why yeah. do more work if we don't have to? Right. So, and someone actually asked me this morning a pretty similar question. He basically asked, do you see smaller companies running Kafka on Kubernetes or is it larger companies? Because if it's smaller companies, it's it may, it's kind of suspicious. It may be people being cool just to be cool. Right. It's a startup. Right. And if it's like a huge bank doing it, then obviously it's a different question. And it's funny because most of the people that I've seen use Kafka on Kubernetes are actually the big players because they have the scale. If you have three microservices, you don't need Kubernetes. And you're right, it is pure overhead 
technical perfection kind of game. But if you have 50,000 microservices and you want to treat Kafka as just another service, is this big cluster with the monitoring and everything that you want to manage it as one set of infrastructure, then it's not overhead. And then it, you start seeing the benefit because you already put in this investment for the first 99,000 <laughs> services that went in there. And you amortize that over many containers and many many services and many infrastructure yes. components. And yes, and you know, when you talk sense. to our cloud team, like they run on Kubernetes. I mean, they don't have that much spare time. I don't think they would do it if it was overhead. I think they're re seeing real operational benefits from running everything on Kubernetes. And everything includes Kafka. All right. Hey, let's see what's next. OK, let's see. Um, respond. OK, you were responding to Stefan's tweet. Uh, you said, it's good to be mindful in picking up new technologies. Kubernetes is most useful when you think of Kafka and the stream processing slash event-driven microservices as a single ecosystem. Using Kubernetes to deploy the entire platform is actually simpler than other options. You kind of just said that. You said it on Twitter. You said it here. I'm still consistent. Yeah, and you are. That's good. So it's nice when you know you're not even thinking of the thing you said before. You say it again. So anyway, Derek Troy West replies to you saying we orchestrate Kafka streams with Kubernetes, but weren't confident we could get the stateful broker bits right on a short project. Next time, perhaps. Can I say yay to everyone running Kafka streams on Kubernetes, like yes. the way it should be done? Because it's awesome and it allows you to get a lot of the benefits of scaling in and scaling out. Yes. But it's also funny because I think of Kafka streams as stateful. Exactly. <laughs> that's what I thought when I read this tweet. It's, I mean, it doesn't have to be, but like almost certainly that's a stateful workload. It's definitely... So we actually had someone on our internal Slack ask about it. Mm -hmm. And basically, we think it's easier to run Kafka Streams as a stateful service because then you get the benefits of RocksDB mm -hmm. being managed as your state versus having to recover it every single time. Right. So you could actually, with Kafka Streams, you can go both ways. And I can see someone preferring to start out stateless and move to stateful. Mm -hmm. But I think you get a lot of benefits from actually treating Kafka Streams as stateful as because stateful. it has a state in it. Yeah, so it the whole can runs. you do stateful on Kubernetes, I mean, you're like the old Paul Mollow commercial said, you're you're soaking in it. You know, you're already, you're already doing it. <laughs> All right, let's see. And then, wow, this is a big, long conversation. Uh, you It's said the same that. comment before. It is. Before. And then um, Michael Gash says, for me, it's about scaling the engineering org and forcing human operations to be codified and hardened, parentheses, increase robustness by breaking it. I guess he means by breaking uh, things in the system to make it, to make it anti-fragile or whatever. Reducing the human error factor, which should not be underestimated. Certainly not in my case. Uh, what do you think? First of all, I love bringing the human element mm -hmm. into it because yeah. at the end of the day, operations engineers, we talk about the technology, but at the end of the day, most of it is about the people yeah. running it. The human thing. element will bring itself in if you don't. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And then the other thing, I love the bit where he says making increased robustness by codifying a lot of the operations mm -hmm. because this is really the big value add of a Confluent operator. You take stuff that was maybe inside the person's head mm -hmm. and you turn it into code that can now be tested, validated, source controlled, evolved, all those good bits. And if you think about it until very recently, if you had to configure monitoring or Jenkins or something, someone would go into UI and just use point and click do to things, do it. Yeah. And if something broke or someone checked anything, there would be no source control. There would be no way to, oh no, we lost our monitoring. Let's just do two clicks and redeploy everything. It would have to painstakingly create the dashboards. And now everything has APIs. So there is absolutely zero excuse not to have everything very repeatable. And Kubernetes kind of is a kind of a forcing function to do For that. that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's like the only way to get things done. Now they have to be coded. Exactly. So there you exactly. go. Exactly. Force. It makes the you better. Org. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. it does. Okay. Um, Craig Hooper asks. Um, he says, "I'm constantly like, uh, we're just waiting for this new feature that's in 1.8. Should be out in the next month or so." And then he says, "Wait, it's 1.10 already." <laughs> Kubernetes moves so fast. Yes. It's kind of like, you know, while I was kind of, I'm still in the process, but we were writing this big reference architecture mm. for Kubernetes. It will be out in just wait a few seconds. Soon. <laughs> yes. And one of the things is that you start reading a lot of resources because you're, you have those questions, right? How do I do X? And you start reading blogs and documentation. 
and it's so easy to, if you read documentation of two versions ago, hopelessly and <laughs> completely out of date, yeah. you have to pay a lot of very close attention because this thing just goes zoom. And I'm guessing, like, I, I follow Kafka very closely, so I may not feel it, but I think Kafka may be kind of the same way. Yeah, mm. probably feels that way from the outside. If I, you're not, if I you're think not, I've, I've heard that yeah. from people, like yeah. they want to keep keep skip running by and who knows what's going on there and it's oh it's version 1.1 already oh my god i'm only running 0 0.9 in production <laughs> so basically neha responding to the entire thread she said, and summarizing it very nicely yeah she said agree there aren't many who have gone stateful on kubernetes successfully kafka is no different we learned it takes significant expertise in both systems that's kafka and kubernetes to do it right but that's surely uh but there's surely a lot of interest in deploying Kafka on Kubernetes. If someone built the right thing, <laughs> she says, with a smile. Should have been a winky smile, I think. Because, uh, yeah, obviously we. And that kind of summarizes right things, thing. things up. There is a lot of interest. Yes, it's not trivial. There's a lot of difficult problems there. But we're here to help. Exactly. <laughs> All right. On to some YouTube comments. Uh, let's see. This was a comment on reading. Kafka data from KSQL. That's a KSQL tutorial video. Uh, Laura asks, is there a way to include all the properties slash columns in a topic into a stream without having to list them out individually? Now, um, I'll take this one because I that was me talking in that video and it was recorded here. And this, you are the KSQL expert. I'm one of them, at least. Uh, recorded here in this very studio. Um, and the examples all show JSON. So if, you're, if you happen to know that video and refer back to it, um, all of the topic data is in JSON format. And so when creating a stream or a table, we have to be explicit about the metadata. You have to provide field names and, and types uh, for the columns that you want to be a part of your stream that you're creating. Uh, and go, please go watch the video if, you, if this is nonsense to you. It, it's, it's not too hard to, to pick up. But if it's JSON data, that JSON data has fields, uh, but there's no typing to it. So in KSQL, you have to say, well, the thing called movie ID is a long and the thing called release here is an int or whatever. If you don't like that, and who could blame you, then you can just use um, Avro and the Confluent Schema Registry. And so if that topic is an Avro topic, then you don't have to do any of that metadata. That KSQL just pulls it out of the Schema Registry for you. Um, and there's a pretty straightforward way to convert JSON to Avro in KSQL, which... Um, I can't really read the case sequel. It doesn't read well on camera if you're just yes. like, speaking it. But <laughs> you, we can tell me. people to go watch the video. You watch the video. It on video. Yeah, uh, I suspect there is a URL that uh, you can you can you can type in or click on, and you can go see that video. So wait, I wanted to use this excuse mm. to redirect the questions that I was asked yesterday. Ah, I just yeah, re yeah. Re realized that you are the perfect person ah, good. to okay. answer that. Here we are. One of my customers that I talked to yesterday said, you know, you keep recommending Avro and Schema Registry, and there's a lot of benefits to that, and we get it, but all the examples are in JSON. Why are mm, all the examples in JSON and not Avro? In JSON? Because it's easier. Um, so the demos that, that we make, that my team makes, uh, the idea is, you know, clone this repo, here's this stuff, inve ingest this into a topic. Um, it's easy to do that. Like, here's a file, a text file that has JSON in it, and you can, mm. like, dump that into a topic, yes. and boom, there you are. Um, and so... So for it's the, a text readability. Yeah, part. the clonable package of here's your stuff, and, and type this and this and this, and you get a cool result, uh, and you feel good about yourself, which is, you know, the goal yes. of those demos. Yes. Um, for you to feel good about yourself. <laughs> Um, Nothing. <laughs> and also you, and, but also to learn. But yeah, that's easier. Um, but it's, again, pretty straightforward. If you have a JSON topic to create a stream whose value format is Avro, and then you, it, it, KSQL does the conversion for you. So good idea for a tutorial video. Thank you, Gwen. All right. Um, that um, YouTube username is a combination of characters that's not a name so I can't read it. Um, but can someone help with this, please? Is there a video that explains why each microservice should have its own data store, parentheses, what Mr. Fowler talks about at the nine minute mark? So this is gonna be a question on Martin Fowler's keynote from the Kafka Summit London 2018. So if you're watching this, um, Highly hundreds, recommended. Hundreds, of, hundreds of years from now, mm -hmm. find that in the archive so you know what we're talking you should, about. You should see it. It's like, 
uh, one of the more enlightening keynotes that I've seen. And it, he goes through a real world example oh, on great. microservices and it's really amazing. And the DJ was pretty good too. Yeah. Yeah, the the the, 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 the person who introduced him. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, no, he was he, great. The yeah. the MC, he was yeah. solid. I, yeah. I, you know, uh, <laughs> you'd have to contact his representation if you want to, you know, book him for your event. But um, no, seriously, I'm glad. I didn't know you liked. It was, it was good. It's good to hear. I I loved it. So, anyway, yeah, it was a super great keynote. Watch it. Check it out. Uh, what this is getting at is that at a certain point, um, Martin's talking about uh, Martin is co-presenter. They're talking about microservices and Kafka as a messaging substrate for the microservices to exchange events and data. And uh, he made the point that uh, the the mutable data store, like an indexable, we'll, we'll just call it a- Relational database? Database, <laughs> yeah, the database. You don't have all these microservices sharing a database because you die that way, right? That's You don't want that. Uh, they communicate through immutable distributed logs, which is Kafka, and the database now, they don't get away from needing a database. You know, Kafka's not indexable. You still need some indexable, uh, you know, formatted data store, and that can be a relational database, and that gets sucked up into the service now. Um, there are also kind of some domain-driven design reasons that we won't belabor here for that, but those have to do with the the bounded context. If if you know each service is ideally what the DDD folks call a bounded context, there's like a particular business thing that that service is doing, and if if it shares a database with other services, that context leaks. And so you don't you don't have that conceptual isolation between services. So you still need a database. You just can't share a database between services. So pull that sucker up into the service. It's fine. Maybe it's not even a relational database, right? Like maybe you need a graph database or you need Elastic or who knows what you need. You just, that, go, that lives inside the service. That's exactly so... Do there is DevOps reasons in addition to the domain driven design ah, reasons? Okay. There is DevOps reasons to have the engineering teams that owns the service owns the entire vertical, so they own the infrastructure. And if they need to slightly different data structure, if they need to make changes, you know, maybe a new index, they control their own fate on their own timelines, versus going to central database teams that owns the whole thing, and you have to know go and beg for an index, right. and they will only right. have time to do it in the next quarter, and then your entire project is delayed. This is not very agile, right? This yeah. is not what agile microservices are all about, which is all about letting small teams own their fate and kind of move fast. So even though I'm a huge fan of big, complex relational databases that own the entire organization. It's kind of where you, you come from. Yes. Uh, you have to admit that this is not conductive to a small, fast, agile, right. moving organization. Right. Fair point. All right. Very good point. So there you go. Hope that's helpful. Uh, absolutely key point. And that's, you know, it's a big part of the story about the, yes. the, the broader value of Kafka. Um, that's basically how Kafka came to be. Yeah, really is. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Metjus, Metjus says, I wonder if the example, and this is in the KSQL streams and tables video, another YouTube question here. I wonder if the example stream, which is Alice giving $100 to Bob, can be translated into the corresponding table directly via KSQL, given the fact that the transaction info is embedded in the $100 to Bob value. Oh, I've got some, got some here. The $100 to Bob value, or if some in the middle application is implied to perform such translation. So that may not have been clear in the video. And if so, I apologize, because again, I was the one speaking there. KSQL is the one doing that translation. So if there's a stream of, of events, and these events are things like, you know, Bob is giving $100 to Alice, it is precisely KSQL that's turning that into a table. Uh, or specifically, it's it's Kafka Streams machinery underneath KSQL. But um, at, the, at this level of abstraction, you can think of it as KSQL. So uh, could there be... Could that happen directly? Yes. In fact, it's so possible that it's actual. So that's actually how it works. So sorry if that wasn't <laughs> So possible that this is actual. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Uh, this is a comment on Neha's Kafka Summit London 2018 keynote. So watch it, please. Like, I can't make you. It's but, probably good because I would. But this is very convincing. Yeah, he it says it's a super duper talk. So super it's not us talk. saying this. No. It's the guys on Absolutely. YouTube, which are clearly more reliable. And Speak yes, <laughs> YouTube comments, definitely more reliable than two of us. Um, and absolutely nailing the American dialect for our international audience. Super duper. You're killing it there. So whatever you're doing, keep doing it. I'm amazed at the clarity of old world issues and how it can be addressed for the new world focused on stream processing. I like the whole talk and the KSQL promise. 
apart from community, is there some enterprise grade support? There happen to be. Yes. We happen to be, you know, we call it Ask Confluent because Tim and I both happen to work for a company called Confluent. Yes, yes we, we, have, we represent. And Confluent happened to have provide enterprise grade support for not just Apache Kafka, but a very nice ecosystem around it, including a lot of the things you heard and a lot of the old world to new world digital transformations is exactly what our team specializes in. Yes. So we'd love to talk to you. So yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> uh, we're mostly about just answering questions here, but... Uh, this is where you get questions answered for and, free. And that's right, that's right. <laughs> if you're interested in support, honestly, it's super easy. Just go to confluent.io and this little thing will pop up down in the corner. There'll be this friendly face that'll say something like, can I answer any questions for you? Just just click on the face, anywhere on the face, it doesn't matter. And, and ask say, your yes. Question. Yes. And <laughs> The rest will be history. All right, well. Okay, yes. So that's all we had for today. We answered a bunch of questions from Twitter, a bunch of questions from YouTube. Thank you so much for watching us on our very first Ask Confluent show. We hope it was really helpful. And if you have more questions about Apache Kafka, about KSQL, about enterprise-grade support, uh, we are looking forward to get your questions via the following Twitter accounts we should probably have down yeah, there somewhere. Somewhere, somewhere below us. Uh, you can ask on YouTube or you can just tweet at us and we hope to see you next time. Yeah. Thanks for having me on the you, show. Yes, you should wave. Oh, <laughs> bye. Bye.